I'm very excited about today and to have two of the, the luminaries of the field joining us. Um, who, uh, one of my, the people I work with um, couldn't believe that there were two people named James Jacobs or Jim Jacobs in California. She thought I had made a mistake when I sent out the karma. <laughs> um, so it was pretty funny. Um, so pre presenter James A. Jacobs um, is the Data Services Librarian Emeritus at the University of California, oh. San Diego, is a co-founder of Free Government Information. Um, and the presenter, James R. Jacobs, uh, is the gov U.S. Government Information Librarian at Stanford University Libraries, where he works on both traditional collection development as well as digital projects like LOCKS, U.S. Docs, and Web Harvesting. He is a co-founder of the free, and also a co-founder of Free Government Information and Radical Reference. Um, so we are very pleased to have him join us uh, today, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, um, thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm Jim. Uh, welcome to the webinar um, on community-based digital collection development of forms for government information. I'm James A. Jacobs in San Diego. You can call me Jim, and my colleague James R. Jacobs will be presenting in the second half of the webinar. You can call him James, and that way no one will get confused. <laughs> sure they won't. <laughs> I'll be presenting, um, introducing today's topics uh, and giving some ideas, uh, background, scope, and even a bit of history. James will be going into some of the technical details about how any library, large or small, even with limited resources, can do actual digital collection development. And I want to mention at the beginning that we're putting our slides and notes and links all on the FTI website at this link, freegovinfo.info slash futurist. Uh, if you go there after, uh, after the webinar, we'll make that page live, and that way you won't have to write down any links that we give during the presentation. That'll be good for you. As an example, uh, some of the information I'll present today comes from a report I wrote for a Center for Research Libraries Forum on Government Information in the Era of uh, Big Data. You can find the links to that forum, the report, my speaker's notes, and more, all at that link, freegovinfo.info slash fugitives. So our topic today is fugitive documents. I, I never liked that term because it has a connotation that implies that these documents have somehow escaped the system. Uh, and that analogy implies that the FDRP is like a prison. I like to think more that we call these publications fugitives because they were available only fleetingly and they disappeared quickly, which is an actual definition of the term fugitive. But the point is, is that these were documents that FDLP libraries could expect that they would get, but did not, so they were outside the FDLP. So what is a fugitive document? Today we're going to use the shorthand term document to refer to any government information, whether it's a single PDF or an HTML page or a video or an audio file or a database or anything else. And a fugitive document is um, outside the system. The Title 44 of the U.S. Code defines what documents go into the FDLP as informational matter published at government expense or as required by law. By the way, that terminology was from a law written 50 years ago, which is why it may sound odd. And a fugitive is anything that fits that definition but does not get into the FDLP. It's worth noting also that Title 44 definition of government publication has some exemptions for things like classified documents and documents that are for official use only. And those kinds of documents are not fugitive because they're excluded from the definition. So what kinds of things become fugitive? Almost anything can be. Here's an example of one that looks like everything else on your document shelves, I would guess. It's a committee print a category of document that for many years Congress considered as internal documents. And until the 1970s, committee prints were not well distributed to the public or the FDLP. Why do things become fugitive? There are many reasons. Here are some that public printer Michael DeMario enumerated uh, 17 years ago. Notice that even then, uh, in 1997, five years after the first web browser, Digital distribution by agencies was already high on the list of reasons that things became fugitive. 
Also note that GPO's official purview is limited by the Paperwork Reduction Act and by Office of Management and Budget Directives that allow executive agencies to avoid complying with even the limited scope of Title 44. So a lot of things which are legitimately within the scope of it, there are loopholes that get things out of the system. Here's some examples of fugitives that DeMario gave in his 1997 testimony. You can see things like technical documents, 70% of technical documents which should have been in FDLP in 1996 were not in FDLP. Uh, there's an example of a journal that became privatized, court decisions, Federal Election Commission statements, CRS reports, and so forth. And here's uh, some examples from a 1989 study by Cynthia Bauer, published in Documents to the People. Uh, Ms. Bauer's paper is a really good one, and I recommend it to you for its scope and scholarship, but also for the clear and insightful way she defines the problem back in 1989. The subjects of these titles that are on this slide are still relevant and sound current today. This should alert us to the fact that these are not ephemeral publications and that we need to capture and preserve documents like this because they provide the historical record of government actions and understandings over time. I'm showing you some of these older examples to demonstrate that the fugitive problem is not a new problem. It's a problem that's always been with us. And as you might imagine, there have been a variety of strategies for dealing with the problem over time. This slide shows some of the range of strategies that have been used or attempted over the years. And as you can see, they include institutional and individual strategies, technical and legal strategies. I want to quickly highlight the DOCX project that's mentioned there and an excellent article on the project by Thomas Shaw and Library Trends that there's a link for. The project was librarian driven. It was created and sponsored by ALA, the ARL, the Special Libraries Association, and the American Association of Law Libraries. DOCX not only found and provided copies of fugitives to subscribing libraries, it also provided a copy to GPO for listing in the monthly catalog. And some of the important fugitive series that DOCX saved, including congressional committee prints, like the one we saw earlier, and the daily report of the Foreign Broadcast Information Service. In these next three slides, I want to move on to the scope of the fugitive problem. Here are some examples from Cynthia Bauer's findings from the 1980s. She has some, find, some fascinating data that seems very familiar, even though it is more than 20 years old. She began by saying that no one knows the scope of the problem, and that's probably still true. She found that the fugitive problem varied by agency and type. So she dug into some of the specifics, finding, for example, that 43% of the documents listed in American Statistics Index were fugitives. And as you can see on the chart at the bottom of the slide, she found that EPA publications, those are the black bars, became less and less likely to be listed in the monthly catalog those are the gray bars, over the decades she studied, and therefore not in the FDLP. Gil Baldwin, who is director of GPO's Library Program Service, estimated in 2003 that about 50% of the universe of federal printing was fugitive, and that 78% of the publications of the National Institutes of Health were fugitive. And this is a graph from the paper I did for Center for Research Libraries on born digital federal government information. Although the size of the fugitive problem is difficult to measure for a number of reasons, the scale can be illustrated by looking at these three different values. On the left, that tiny little blip is the 10,000 items distributed by GPO to FDLP libraries in one year. In the middle are all two to three million items estimated to be held in the Federal Depository Library program in total. And the right bar that overwhelms the first two bars is the 160 million URLs harvested in a single year in the 2008 end of term crawl. Now, I imagine that you have a lot of questions about that 160 million figure, and I want to address some of those and will in a couple of different ways. Your first question might be, isn't all that in GPO's FDSIS? And the answer is we don't know because GPO does not provide statistics on the quantity of its holdings. But there are some things that we do know about the content of FDCIS. We know, for instance, that most of what is in FDCIS is from a single branch of government. 
GPO list collections that are in SDSIS, and more than half of those are explicitly con congressional. We also know that GPO has been getting more data from the judicial system, specifically opinions of some but not all of federal appellate district and bankruptcy courts, but only going back to 2004. We also know that the biggest gap in FDCIS is information from executive agencies. GPO has a page listing government authors, and apparently only 56 of the 181 authors listed are executive department agencies. The 2013 U.S. Government Manual lists 246 agencies. So to summarize this brief overview, the fugitive problem is not a new problem. No matter what the exact number of fugitive is, fugitives is, the number is very, very large. And the information content of fugitives is important and should be available to our users and preserved for future users. And finally, there's no foolproof strategy or solution to the fugitive problem yet. Given this knowledge of the fugitive problem, how might we act? I suggest to you that in absence of a universal solution, we should each do what we can by focusing on the needs of our own communities of users. This means that every library can contribute, and we can create a universal strategy by developing a loosely coupled, decentralized strategy. James and I are suggesting that individual libraries can attack the problem of foreign digital fugitive documents by selecting, acquiring, and preserving them. James is going to go into how we can do that next, but before I turn it over to him, I want to give you very briefly a bit of technical context to selecting foreign digital government information. I have three technical notes for you. Don't worry, they're not very technical. The first one is about terminology. We, want, we might want to talk about selecting a page or a title or even a file, but what do those terms mean? and How do they relate to our selecting information? I use the Final Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement of the Keystone XL Pipeline Project as an example, and here is a picture of its web page. Now, if we wanted to preserve this page, we would need to preserve 13 files with 13 unique URLs. That includes the HTML file that is this page and its URL, plus the other files that comprise the content of the page. Seven image files, three JavaScript files, two file sheet files. If we wanted to preserve this page uh, of this environmental impact statement, we'd have to preserve 13 files. That's the file that the HTML file that is this page and its URL, and all the image files, JavaScript files, and style sheet files for this page. But if what we want to preserve is the title of that is the environmental impact statement itself, we need to preserve. 94 separate PDF files that comprise the 11 volumes and all the parts of the EIS. And we could do that without preserving the HTML file or any of those JavaScript files or style files. So here's, now we're back to um, technical note number two, the issue of which version, edition, or copy we select. And the example I've chosen here is a single executive order number 13662 about blocking property of additional persons contributing to the situation in Ukraine. One obvious first choice for selecting this executive order would be the GPO authenticated version in FDSIS, as is pictured on this slide. But what about all those other versions on the web? I looked and found 10 different URLs that apparently have the same executive order or metadata about it. Some of the other copies I found include the White House copy, the Federal Register site copy, the Federal Register printer-friendly copy, the GPO Federal Register PDF version, the GPO Federal Register HTML version, and GPO's HTML version. And this raises questions. Are all these really the same? How do we decide which to select and preserve, or should we preserve them all? And it also brings up the question about the links to these. Link, users will link to them now and want to get back to the content that they link to sometime in the future. Should we preserve the links? Will the individuals have links to different versions? Should we preserve what was actually linked to so that a user in the future can find out what they linked to and cited in the past? James is going to go into more detail in a moment, 
But as a preview to what a possible answer to all those questions is, I would say it depends. It depends on what and how you select. One library might have a collection of all executive orders and use one strategy to select and acquire them. Another might be selecting the Federal Register and another crawling the White House website. Still another library might not select any of these publications or document types or websites, but be selecting on a topic of Ukraine or a foreign policy or a Russian foreign policy and what this particular executive order as part of that collection. Each library could have different selection criteria and procedures and be equally correct in their choices. Here's my last technical note. Technical note number three, .gov or .bill or beyond. To illustrate this issue, I've chosen a web page on the White House website that lists social media sites where the White House posts information. It lists a total of 92 accounts on 26 non.gov social media websites. This raises questions such as how much information is duplicated, and how much is unique, and do these sites simply point back to .gov websites? And would it be of value to preserve how the website presented itself differently to different communities in social media? Again, you can imagine different libraries making different choices for their different communities. The strength of a loosely coupled, decentralized, user-focused strategy is that all these decisions are equally correct and they all serendipitously reinforce and complement each other. I'm going to stop there and turn it over to James. James? Okay. Thanks, Jim. And thanks, everyone, for, uh, for coming today. I hope you can hear me. Um, so, as, as Jim notes, um, the fugitive problem and the attempted solutions to it has been long-standing. Um, I'll show you a couple of ways that libraries can attack this problem head-on in the born digital era. I've got three overarching messages that I hope everyone will take away from my talk today. One, pointing is not collecting. Two, access is not preservation. And three, collection development is still key to the FDLP. But first, I'd like to answer the, the, uh, answer the question, why collect fugitives or digital fugitives? Nobody would doubt that we have amazing online access to government documents today, and Jim showed you some, um, some examples of those. Um, however, the national bibliography doesn't just create itself and doesn't just magically appear in Google search results, much less the catalog of government publications. In the print era, it was GPO's primary responsibility to print and distribute documents in scope of the FDLP. And as Jim noted, the sheer amount of documents and the number of agency publishers producing born digital documents today means that librarians now more than ever need to shift from passive receivers of FDLP documents to being active in the collection process. Put yourself in, a, in an information seeker's shoes uh, which search result would you rather see if you were looking for information on, for example, data analysis and law enforcement? Would you like to see your library's catalog um, results of 134 targeted and organized ads-free search results, including this fugitive document that I collected from the Bureau of Justice Assistance? Or would you rather see Google's 3.2 million search results, which include ads, news items, and other random, unmediated information. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, is the issue of link rot. Those 3.2 million search results make it seem like the public has amazing information access. Uh, but access today does not equal permanent public access, which is, after all, the core tenet of the FDLP. And this access is completely at the mercy of information producers. While the average lifespan of physical government documents is about 50 years, according to the Internet Archive, the estimated lifespan of the URL uh, is 44 to 75 days. While .gov and .mil websites are slightly more stable than some websites, link rot, the process by which Internet hyperlinks disappear, is a real and growing concern. According to the data collected by the Chesapeake Digital Preservation Group, which has been studying link rock of the .gov domain since 2008, 
51% of the URLs from their original 2008 data set were 404, where links not found. So we cannot, really, we cannot rely on linking to government information. We must continue and actually redouble our efforts at foreign digital collection development. Okay, so now we know what we're up against. Um, and Jim scoped that out very well. Um, we're up against the 160 million uh, figure in his, uh, in his chart. Um, so now I'll talk about what I'm doing here at Stanford um, to, to do digital collection development. I'm not just pointing to government documents or relying on Google or GPO for that matter. I'm building government documents collections for my local community. And by focusing my collecting on fugitive documents, I'm pitching in to help build and expand the national bibliography. I'm developing tools and processes to collect individual documents drop by drop, as well as the wider ocean of internet, do internet documents. For individual document collection, I'm using what we at Stanford call EAMS, or Everyday Electronic Materials. EAMS was a Mellon grant that Stanford Libraries got uh, about four years ago now um, that we received in order to build workflows and policies so that all of the bibliographers in the library could collect foreign digital books and documents and other materials. EAMS are those documents that I find and download as I go about my daily work. EAMS are digital materials that are serendipitously referenced in news reports distributed by postings on websites or through email notification. I'm also actively tracking on eight federal agencies, including the Bureau of Land Management, OMB, NOAA, Department of Justice, USDA, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Regulation and Enforcement. I don't even know how to pronounce their acronym, B-O-E-M-R-E, BOEMRE, or something like that, National Cancer Institute, and the National Institutes of Health, which, as Jim noted, has historically been one of the largest producers of fugitive documents. I, I gathered this list of, of agencies based on analysis of the Lost Docs blog, and these eight agencies are particularly egregious fugitive publishers. Besides collecting these born digital materials, I am sending any fugitives I find to GPO to be added into the CGP. Um, I'm also grateful for the one or two hours a month assistance I get from Laura Lind, one of our acquisition staff. The EAMS project has put in place infrastructure and a workflow to support EAMS collection, dis description, preservation, and public access for Stanford Libraries collections. And for those chomping at the bit to know more about EAMS, you can go to, uh, to that bit.ly link there, uh, which is a link to uh, a report that my, cat, my, my colleague Catherine Cott did for the Coalition of Networked Information, or CNI. Uh, I think she did this in 2010. So my EAMS workflow is pretty straightforward um, and has put in place, this, this same workflow has been put in place for all of the bibliographers here at, uh, at Stanford. One, I identify a document that I want to collect. Um, I'm limited at this point to collecting only PDFs and only monographs. Um, serials are, are a, special, a special hell for, <laughs> for catalogers and, and acquisition staff. I take a take document that I find on the web and I drag that URL to our custom EAMS browser widget, which I don't have uh, a picture of here. I determine the copyright status. Uh, for me, I don't really have to do this because um, most, of, at least most of the federal documents that I collect are in the public domain, uh, but other bibliographers do have to um, uh, request copyright uh, clearance from the, from the publishers. I describe the document. The, the widget shows a, a form with a title, author, rights, status, comments, and a link back to the original site. I submit that form to our acquisitions and cataloging staff, and it goes through our workflow and is digitally deposited and stored locally in our Stanford Digital Repository and made accessible through our catalog, along with the link back to the original site. This is just one example of the over 600 EAMs that I've collected to date and probably three quarters of those 600 have been fugitive. And you'll see uh, below where it says available online that there's a link back to bja.gov as well as to pearl.stanford.edu, which is our uh, Stanford Digital Repository. But think what we could do if 100 libraries or 1,000 libraries instituted this workflow. Collectively, we could cover all 246 federal agencies 
to assure that no born digital document within the scope of the FDLP falls through the cracks and becomes fugitive. Of course, this uh, drop by drop collecting is time consuming, not just for me, but for our acquisitions and cataloging staff. For larger quantities, then, for sites that produce too many documents to make EAMS feasible, I'm using Archive It to harvest entire websites. Web harvesting, I should note, is not a panacea, but without it, there's no way to create .gov or .mil oriented digital archives. Archive It is a subscription service from the Internet Archive, which, by the way, has many digital historic government documents available in its text collection. It's an easy collection building tool whereby you give the software a list of URLs, which they call seeds, and you schedule the crawler to harvest the seeds and then give public access to the content that's collected. It's a good way to contextualize or make sense of the ocean of content on the open web and why I've built harvested collections on subject areas and document types, uh, for example, fugitive agency sites. Um, those are some of the agencies which I'm collecting. Uh, and as well, I've, I've targeted individual items like the Keystone EIS that, uh, that Jim noted earlier, the NOAA Deepwater Horizon Archive, um, and the Sourcebook of Criminal Justice Statistics, which was uh, published by SUNY Albany, um, co-published by DOJ and SUNY Albany, uh, but it, it recently um, met its own demise. Um, the other one that I have listed there is the NBII, the National Biological Information uh, Index, something to that effect. Um, was a huge database of, of biological information, technical reports, et cetera. And that, um, that died a couple of years ago, and several of us attempted to harvest what we could. I'm also harvesting, as you see, FOIA reading rooms um, and CRS reports, which don't fall within the scope of the FDLP, but are important to, uh, to my local users and to, um, to the public. So since 2007, I've crawled about 70 million documents, and I've archived about 5.1 terabytes of data. By doing this work, I'm continuing the long tradition of the FDLP in creating rich, redundant, distributed collections. I realize that I can't do everything myself, so I'd like to call on the FDLP community to help build FDLP reservoirs. I know of a few other libraries who are currently working in this area, and I want to give a shout out to, uh, especially to the um, Southern Oregon University and their SODA archive, um, which focuses on, um, on the, the Southern Oregon, Northern California bio, bio, bio system, I think they call it, and the University of New Orleans and some other libraries um, of which I'm not aware. Here are some things that you can do today, you can start doing today, to help build FDLC reservoirs. You can keep track of your favorite agencies, publications, and data, and you can make sure those URLs are in the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine. It's easy to do if you go to the Wayback Machine and paste in the URL, um, you'll know right away whether or not that URL is in the Wayback Machine because you'll either get results or you won't get results. Um, you can see the cloud by submitting fugitives to the GPO with their lost docs form. So if you come across a a digital document that's of particular interest, you can search for it in the CGP, and if it's not there, you know it's fugitive, and you can submit that form uh, to the GPO for them to catalog it. And I would also hope that you would send your, your GPO receipts to the Lost Docs blog so that we can list it um, to see the cloud further. Um, you can also save documents to local web servers and or upload them to the Internet Archive. You can build web harvested collections that your local community wants or needs. And as I said earlier, the SODA archive is a, is a great example of this, where they collect um, federal documents uh, focused on, the, on their bioregion, on the history of that region, and on the First Nations in that region. And you can join the Everyday Electronic Materials Zotero group and help us test out a newer, faster, more automatic fugitive document workflow. Um, just a, a quick note about this. Um, Zotero, for those of you who don't know, is a uh, bibliographic management uh, tool. It's a free Firefox plugin, um, and it, there's also a standalone client if you, if you prefer that. Um, but tr traditionally, it's used so that people can collect uh, citations to the journal articles and books that they're using 
um, and then later uh, use that to, to write um, in Word and, and connect up to make footnotes and endnotes and things. Um, it's similar to EndNote and Mendeley and, and a bunch of other tools that are out there. So uh, Jim and I, Jim and Daniel Cornwall and I have created this Zotero group, which um, once you save a citation to that group, uh, we have a script running that will, uh, right now it's taking that, that citation and posting it automatically to the Lost Docs blog, but we're in we're in talks with the GPO now to uh, to see if they would be interested in, in working with this, so that we could automatically send them emails as well um, to have them catalog the fugitives. Um, and lastly, I should note um, I've started a an FDLP IRC channel, which is Internet Relay Chat. Um, it's old school chat for for those of you who don't know about IRC. Um, and it, but I've, I've opened this channel up so that, uh, that we can all share best practices, talk about how to adopt an agency, and anything else you want to discuss in terms of fugitives and digital collection development. I should note this isn't uh, uh, my attempt to, to make an end around uh which is a, a great listserv, and I hope everyone is subscribed to that. Um, but it's, uh, it's a, another way of communicating um, and possibly a faster way so that you don't have to wait for, um, for GovDocL to post it and distribute it out the email. Um, yes, the membership to the Zotero group is closed, but I believe you can request uh, to be added to that group. Um, and if you, if you have problems, Jeremy, you can email me at jrjacobs at stanford.edu. So in, in ending, um, this is your FDLP, and I hope that all of you will, will help um, and participate in building uh, the National Bibliography. So the driving force behind the FDLP is distributed access to and preservation of government information. But the scope of the problem in the 21st century, as Jim so, uh, so rightly pointed out, is too large for GPO or any one library to do on their own. This is our FDLP and it's time for everyone to pitch in. Together we can continue the FDLP rather than sit idly by while it drifts into the myths of history. Thank you. And now I guess we can take questions. Uh, the question is, is there a record of what content is being collected, by whom, and under what technical decisions? This is the, uh, the librarian question. Um, and I, I study this a little bit for my CRL paper, and I, I go into a, a little bit more detail of the answer in that paper than I'll give right now, because it's too detailed to go into. The short answer is no, there's not a record. And the longer answer is that you can dig around and find some things, and I did as much as I could for the paper and list a lot of the things that are discoverable if you dig in terms of who's collecting what and what the scope is and what are their conditions and time periods and all of that kinds of thing. And I published that in the CRL paper. Um, but we definitely need to have a, a way of sharing what it is that we're collecting. And one easy way we can do it is by making sure that GPO knows and things get into GPO's bibliographic system. Uh, but we probably need something that can scale up to the size that we're talking about and gives us more functionality than GPO has at the moment. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I would only add to that that um, I just a few days ago I emailed um, uh, some friends of mine in the GPO and asked them just how many fugitive um, fugitives they they receive, how many forms they receive from the community. Um, they're working on that number, um, and so I'm not I'm not sure if that number has gone down because people don't know about the lost docs form, um, or if that number has gone up because everyone is going, oh my God, here's a document that should be um, in the in the system and it isn't. Um, but I would suggest that the lost docs form is a great way to um, to make sure that things get cataloged. And by the way, if you if you send in a, a fugitive, it does get cataloged and it gets distributed out through the uh, the GPO's bibliographic record program, 
as well as uh, Markive if you uh, if your library is subscribed to uh, the Markive uh, system. And so you're not only helping yourself, but you're helping all of the libraries uh, receive those fugitive documents. So we have a um, question from Connie. Um, I'm not sure we have a place to save such docs. What should I ask to see if we do have such a place? Um, I, I can give a, a quick answer to this, and James may want to expand on it. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that we can do is use other people's computer space. I'm assuming you're talking about you know, literally where do you store the PDF. Uh, archive it is, as James mentioned, uh, a service of the Internet Archive. And when you use Archive it, as, as James explained, you don't have to have your own space because Archive is using Archive it is using Internet Archive space. Um, there, there are other ways you can do things. James, do you want to address that some more? Sure, sure. So I think um, what Connie is getting at is uh, what you need is a web server. Um, so if you, for example, have um, have space where you can create web pages um, for you know public consumption, then you have a web server. If you have um, if you have libguides. Uh, and can attach documents to a, to a libguide, then you have uh, a web server. Um, if, you're, if you have an account on the Internet Archive, that's archive.org, then you can, you can upload those documents to the Internet Archive um, and have them preserved on their server. So there's, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, the Internet Archive also has a, a U.S. documents collection, um, and if you Create an account and then email them and tell them that you want to have permission to to upload documents into that U.S. documents collection specifically. Then uh, they'll give you permission to do that. Um, and that way, you know, even if you don't have a web server or you don't have any space um, or your library doesn't allow you to to do that, uh, you can still upload those files to the Internet Archive. And James, uh, Lynn mentions that there's a cost to archive. It is a subscription service. Do you have uh, can you say something about what the cost is? Yeah, the the cost that's um, it's it's definitely not a small cost. Um, the subscription is somewhere depending on your library size and, and what you want to do. Um, it's something like ten thousand dollars a year, um, up to you know I think I'm paying twelve thousand dollars a year uh, for a little extra space. Um, the the nice thing about it is that they're not charging for uh, for the amount of data that that they're storing for you. They're charging for the use of of the archive at crawler um, and all of that. So the the cost the subscription doesn't go up, you know, as you as you collect more and more uh, data. But it is a it is a, a cost that um, that's not uh, it's not free and it's nothing to sneeze at. Um, I know the Internet Archive has been um, amenable to um, to having multiple libraries have one subscription. So, for example, if you had a uh, a small consortium of libraries who who wanted to create collections um, or do web harvesting, um, the Internet Archive would be uh, would be willing to do that. Um, they've done that for other consortia, and so you might be able to get together with uh, with several libraries. Um, and, and make the cost um, that much lower for each of you. Uh, if you, yeah, I understand the cost is a is a big barrier. Um, if uh, if anyone wants a, a contact to the Internet Archive, uh, you can email me, and I, I'll I'll get you that. Um, Jr. Jacobs at Stanford.edu. I, I think it's also worth noting that it, it costs to run a library, right? Costs are part of our doing business. And one of the things, one, one of the ways that you can sell this to administrators is what are you getting for the money you pay? And one of the things that I've seen over time is that you put resource, library resources into creating links to stuff, and then you put more resources into correcting the links or, or removing them when the links go away. And you're, it's sort of a black hole of expending things, expending your resources that you're not getting good payback for. Whereas doing your own 
collection development in the way that James and I are describing. You're putting resources into stuff that you're controlling. And you don't have to keep putting money in to try to keep it linked to the same information. So I, I, yes, there's a cost, but I think you're getting more for your money when you actually are doing your own collection development. Yeah. I also want to mention that there, there was a comment back, uh, someone provided the link to the Wave chat bubble, and someone asked James, could you explain your workflow again for collecting single fugitive documents working with your acquisitions department in the widget? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, I can explain that again. Um, just uh, one more point on the on the cost issue. Um, there's a, a new company called VoxGov, V-O-X-G-O-V, and they are actually um, collecting public domain materials and then offering a subscription service to libraries and others. Um, I tested out their their service and. They wanted $23,000 a year subscription fee uh, for that service. So um, private companies are getting interested in in actual do, in actual digital collections and think that there's a think that there's a market for that. Um, $23,000 is a lot more than $12,000 a year, and as Jim noted, you actually control the content that you collect. Um, and yeah, there was another question about Jeremy saying uh, collections created by the archive are automatically included in the Internet Archive, and that is yes. Um, you will have your own collections as well as uh, moving those URLs into the Wayback Machine, the general Wayback Machine. So the getting back to the widget collection, um, so I you know I'll I'll go to a, a URL that has a a, a document linked on it, and uh, the widget is just a little piece of JavaScript that goes into my toolbar. And when I when I click on that button, uh, a form comes up. Um, it's the Eames form, and on that form is a a, a field for author, title, uh, URL, uh, notes, uh, copyright um, uh, copyright status. I fill in that form with whatever notes I want. I, I usually grab, um, you know, I usually copy and paste a bit of the of the abstract or the um, uh, something that describes the document. Then I'll hit that button and it goes directly to um, to a, a server um, that is a staging area, um, and a, a ping. Uh, an email gets sent to one of the catalogers. They they then get to the document. Um, they'll do the cataloging. They'll look for copy, uh, but if it's a fugitive document, then chances are uh, they're doing original cataloging um, because obviously it's not in the in the CGP and there's no copy out there. Um, then once they catalog it, they uh, they send it on its way, and it goes into uh, back into the staging area where the bibliographic record is um, uploaded to our ILS, and the the document itself is uploaded to our digital repository. Um, and there's a there's a permanent URL created that um, that goes to uh, that that is put into the bibliographic record and links to the digital repository. That's that pearl.stanford.edu link that I talked about. I want to mention too, while we have a pause in the questions, that the you know, techniques that James has outlined are just some. And there are other techniques and other technical possibilities and hybridizations of these techniques that we can use. Um, for instance, if your library has an institutional repository, uh, it has the software that's capable of uh, saving documents. And it's possible that if you talk to the folks who run that institutional repository, there's a way that you could create a collection of government documents using software that you already have. Um, there's a variety of software that's available for um, building collections that is either free or inexpensive. There's, there's some shareware things that build good collections and can be hosted on uh, most modern computers, uh, so it's possible to start developing your own digital collection within your library. Um, and it's possible to do things in a hybrid way. James mentioned that Archive It 
the, the big charge is for uh, using their crawler. Of course, you can run your own crawler if you're technically minded, and I know a lot of us are these days. You could uh, create you could create your own collections locally and then upload them to Internet Archive to save some money. Mm -hmm. And yes, Jenny, uh, this, uh, Jenny asks about uh, whether this was covered in DLC. Um, some of the slides uh, that I've used today were from my DLC presentation um, back in November or something like that. And I think I did answer Jeremy's question. Um, the URLs that I collect uh, through Archive-It um, are saved um, as Archive-It, and then eventually those do uh, go into the general Wayback Machine. And yes, uh, you can upload files to Internet Archive at no cost. All you have to do is create an account um, and then once you once you're logged in with that account, there'll be a, a button that says upload, and you can upload anything you want to the Internet Archive. Lots of people do uh, video and music. There's a huge music archive, and then if you wanted to, you could, if you uploaded a file, uh, if you wanted to catalog it for your local collection, uh, you could catalog it and give a link to the Internet Archive's uh, copy of that document. The FOIA documents, um, if you go to archive-it.org, uh, you, can, you can search in there. Oh, there's the organization. Organization slash 159 is me, actually. And so you can go to that link. Thanks, Jim, for putting that up. And uh, you'll see the FOIA collection. Um, it's, it's kind of a cool collection. I'm harvesting all of the reading rooms from the from the federal agencies which have FOIA reading rooms. And I'm also putting in FOIA documents that, uh, that other groups and people um, put online. Uh, when I find them, I'm, I put them up. Uh, so for example, the um, Cryptome is a, is a really interesting site that does FOIA documents, as well as the, the uh, what was that called, Jim? The Government Attic. Is another place that um, the gentleman who runs that site does a lot of FOIA requests, and when he when he gets a response to his FOIA requests, he puts those documents up on his website. So there's lots of people that are doing them. Uh, Secrecy News is uh, Stephen Aftergood's site, and he has a ton of uh, FOIA documents. And <laughs> that's a good question, Connie. I'm doing FRUS because um, they are posted in different places. Um, so University of Wisconsin has a great uh, archive where they've digitized uh, a bunch of the older uh, volumes of the foreign relations of the United States. And uh, the, uh, is it the congressional historian or the, the Senate historian? I think it's the Senate historian site has, has some of the FRUS uh, volumes um, in ebook form. So I'm just I'm collecting those so I can put them all together and give uh, my users access to all of the FRUS sites uh, from one from one search. And of course, we don't know we don't know whether the those sites system. will always be there, whether links will change, whether individual volumes mm -hmm. will be uh, moved or altered or removed. Yeah, CRS is another one of those, Jenny. Um, you know, traditionally, the Congressional Research Service um, doesn't consider their documents to be uh, within scope of the FDLP because they consider it as as um, privileged communication between LC and, and Congress. Um, but a lot of places online have CRS reports. There's uh, OpenCRS.com. Uh, University of North Texas has a CRS archive. Secrecy News has a lot of CRS reports. Um, the National Security Archive from George Washington University hosts some CRS reports. They're all focused on different areas of CRS, and so they, they nobody nobody archives and gives access to all of them. Um, so I've I've attempted to collect. I think I have about 20 sites now that post uh, CRS reports, and so I I collecting them all together in one place. Um, that archive, the CRS Reports archive, 
has a search to it, and you can search and find CRS reports from across all of those websites. There's also a bit of JavaScript code, Jenny, if you want to, if you want to put that a search box to the CRS reports or to the FOIA reading rooms or to any of the other um, organizations or any of the other collections that I'm using in Archive It, um, and you can you can just put that little bit of JavaScript into a web page, and it'll create a little search box that searches that collection. I think we're right near the end of the hour. Are there any last questions? Uh, while you're thinking or typing, I want to mention uh, the link that's on your screen now, freegovinfo.info slash fugitives. Uh, that page is not live now, but we'll be working on it and putting it up later today. And as I said, we'll put a copy of our slides. We'll put links that we've mentioned um, and, uh, and other information that may be of help to you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'll put that script to the, to the search widget up um, on the on the fugitive site there at the freegovinfo.info slash fugitives as well. And you're free to, uh, to copy and paste that, that script into, uh, into your web page or into your loop guide or wherever you'd like to put it. Just thank you very much for doing this, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Yes, thank you, everyone. We had a great thank time you. today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Linda.